I knew right away, like, it's not like I was there to be the John Moxley of the promotion, but it, you know, Matt, Matt Jackson said something like we, we just want your brain around. So good to see you here. So good to have Colt Cabana back on the show. Our last interview, which was also our first interview together and also our first interview that we ever did in front of a live crowd was almost two years ago, right before the all out pay-per-view in Chicago. You can check it out right up there. And this interview is brought to you by our friends at Tiege Hanley. Love those guys. Their tagline is uncomplicated skincare for men because let's be honest here, most of you aren't using skincare right now, so the last thing you want it to be is complicated. Everything you need is delivered in this box right here. And it's all explained in this handy little card that comes inside the box, telling you exactly what to use, when to use it, and how much of it to use. And it's as simple as one, two, three. Number one, you got the wash. I'm sure you're familiar with washing your face, but you do that twice a day, once in the morning when you wake up, and once at night, right before you go to bed. Then you got the scrub. It says right there, two times per week, and that's exactly how often you'll wanna use it. It digs in deep, gets rid of all that extra grime and grossness that is currently on your face right now. And then you end with the moisturizer. AM moisturizer in the morning, PM moisturizer at night. And that's it. It's really that simple. And at 38 years old, this has been my own personal fountain of youth. And if you've never used skincare before, you're gonna see some pretty noticeable results after just your first month with Tiege Hanley. And because Tiege Hanley sponsored today's video, they are hooking you up. Click that link down below in the description and not only will you get the best possible price, but they're also gonna give you a free gift with your first box. So click that link down below and get started for just 25 bucks. Let's get to our man. Let's get to Colt Cabana right now. Good to see you, my friend. Great to be seen. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, is this a sewing machine that's behind you? Yeah, people get a glimpse into my uh, my office slash sewing machine room slash gear room slash uh, merch table slash everything. Uh, there you go. There it is. That's my sewing machine. I, I've made many a gear that have been seen in New Japan, Ring of Honor, and uh, AEW. Are you right still making your own gear? Of course, you can never find anyone. I mean, listen, do you want me to, Has have you gone into gear making in, on uh, these shows before really? Not, not as in depth as we're about to right now. <laughs> it's just, it's, we find as wrestlers, we find, see, this is why pro wrestling tees is so great. Something we have gone about. As wrestlers, we find people who make something, who do something good at something we need. And then we tell all of our friends and then they become overwhelmed and then they're they're unreliable. So if someone finds a gear maker, it's one person. You know, I had a tweet the other day that uh, a lot of people seem to enjoy where it said, uh, you know, easy money. Uh, everyone stole easy money's moves. So he stole everybody's money by, you know, <laughs> not giving them their gear, which was something he was notorious for. Um, it's just because he got so overwhelmed and then he's got 25 orders and you, you know, as someone who makes gear, it, it takes a day, you know, or a pair yeah. of trunks takes a couple of hours. And then, so I, you know, I can't find anyone that I, that I just can count on. So I know I can count on myself, the story of my career, Chris. And, um, also, you know, I'm frugal too, so. Where, where do you even begin to learn how to make gear? Okay, so I went to high school with uh, a friend of mine named Jocelyn. Jocelyn moved down to Georgia to become a softball player. She ended up marrying a actual professional wrestler while I was in wrestling. She knew nothing about wrestling. His name was Crew Jones. They moved back to Chicago and Crew and I were both like struggling wrestlers. And Crew was like, I got to make my own gear. And I was like, I got to make my own gear. And so then Crew Jones's mother-in-law taught him. He came over one day, gave me like a three-hour crash course. And ever since then, I've been just trying to get better. And it's been a whatever, an 18-year process to, to learn how to make gear. But the problem when you start making gear is all of your buddies start going, hey, Colt, I hear you make gear. Right. So I've I've made two pairs of, of, of gear. I've made one for uh, Matt Cross. And one for Sanjay. Years later, I saw Sanjay selling them um, on his <laughs> Facebook. And I was like, Sanjay, I gave those to you for free. And he's like, ah, I made some money off of it. I was like, <laughs> uh, so also, I know when you get gear, it's um, 
you know, I, I'm so picky about it. So I don't want to have to like give it to somebody else and then being like, this fits wrong. I don't want that pressure. I just yeah. want that pressure for myself. So <laughs> I only do it for myself. So I had Conrad Thompson on the show a few months ago and I called him the pod father of wrestling interviews. And I got corrected by many, many people saying, sure, he has seven podcasts <laughs> and he does very well and he's at the top of the charts. But Colt Cabana, he is the true pod father of wrestling interviews. Uh, well, Conrad's always been very kind and quick to say that it's appreciative. And Taz is always, you know, he was one too that was quickly to correct. I, I actually said the other day, and I've said this before, is uh, with the Young Bucks, it's like, you know, I set this kind of, not the standard, or I figured out this model of independent wrestling and how to kind of make yourself your own business. And then the yeah. Young Bucks kind of saw it. And then they were like, oh, but I know how to grow this thing even bigger. And I think Conrad's the same way. It's like, you know, Conrad realized the the greatness of podcasting and saw that, you know, maybe I was having some success at it and some other people. And then he, you know, through his business mind, just blew it up. And so I always give props to the Young Bucks and to Conrad. They're, they're, they both know exactly what they're doing. Sometimes I believe uh, as a control freak, a little bit of myself, like that's some of my downfall is that I've never been able to give more people uh, things to do. I want to do everything because I want to control everything. So with the Bucks, it was, you know, his Matt's wife, you know, Dana and, and uh, they started, you know, letting Ryan get really more into it with pro wrestling tees uh, for their business. And for Conrad, he's obviously streamlined everything. And um, for me, it's always kind of been a mom and pop shop and I, I kind of like to keep it that way. So yeah, I have been podcasting, I, you know, with something we've gone over 2010, I, I saw an opening the market. I said, when is somebody going to do this show? Yeah. Um, and then finally I did it. And then, you know, just recently I've started a new podcast called wrestling anonymous. And I was saying, when is somebody going to do this kind of show? And I realized, Oh, that's, that's me. Once again, I'm going to do it. It's something completely different. Um, and I think that's the fun of it is, um, you know, we, there's so many podcasts, wrestling podcasts in the podcast space and, you know, the, the better ones, they rise to the top and then you're looking for new, what, like what are new genres in the podcasting wrestling space. And so this, I think this definitely is one. And so I'm excited to jump into it. So when we did our last interview, it was almost two years ago and you were done with the art of wrestling. You basically said, look, I've talked to everybody. I've done everything I can do busy with other things. Why are you getting back into the podcasting space now? Well, the pandemic and quarantine has kept us at home. And <laughs> that's created a lot of podcasters. <laughs> yeah. And it's also made me realize that I, I maybe don't have to wrestle 200 days a year on the road. And maybe there's other ways of, of expressing my creativity. Uh, I, I, always, I love the idea of editing and producing and, and directing I love to be, you know, like the, doing these podcasts because it is post-produced and I'm collecting these phone calls from other fans and I'm editing them up together and I'm figuring out the best order of how to put them. Essentially, I'm a curator for this show. Um, it, it's really inspired me a lot. And so, you know, I can substitute going to shows. And in the past, it was like, I need to go to shows because I wanted, I need to be on that show with Demolition Smash so I can get him on my show <laughs> because I did them all in person, right? So yeah. Yeah, I would see an opportunity of like, oh, uh, Just Incredible is going to be in this area. I, I, I should do that show because, yes, I'll, I'll make money from the show and I'll sell merch, but I'll also get to have Just Incredible on my show. And that's going to be a good week for me. Whereas this is streamlining through, you know, Google Voice, people just sending a message. So I, I don't it's it's the the hustle to get to these shows isn't as uh, imminent. And um, and I and I'm taking uh, the, the quarantine and I'm taking COVID very serious. And so it's nice to kind of a, really, a realization of my own life of that, like, I don't have to race back on the road to hustle because through, through Twitch, through Patreon, through podcasting, through YouTube, I'm able to make a decent living. And then most importantly, you know, I was able to sign a contract with AEW and Tony Khan has kept everything moving, everything going. He's done it all safely. And TNT has, you know, allowed us to do every other week so we can fly in every other week. And because of AEW, you know, I'm definitely able to make a great living. And that's kind of, I, I think, the main reason of why it's easy for me to jump into podcasting and maybe, maybe push back on doing every single independent wrestling show ever. <laughs> So the idea behind the new podcast, the idea behind Wrestling Anonymous is basically how wrestling has transformed the lives of fans. And you, like you said, you're taking phone calls from people who are 
basically telling this story, funny stories, sad stories, and everything in between. Yes. Yeah. I, it's, there's a lot of uh, inspiration through this. Um, I, I think there's a little inspiration through, there's a lot through nostalgia. Like I love the idea that I'm doing this show, but I know in 30 years, people are going to be able to look back and hear these stories of these times in the current times and then also past times. So uh, there's that. Um, there's a lot of like old timey radio that I feel I'm, I'm really inspired by. You know, there's, this is essentially a hotline call. And I love, I, I love being I, like, I, I'm calling myself the curator. I love being the curator of this. You know, th these aren't my stories. These are everybody's stories. Um, but sometimes we don't have a place to put these stories. So I'm giving everybody a platform. You know, I did say in like my trailer that for years, fans asked me to be on my show and it broke my heart that I was like, this isn't a fan's show. It's for the yeah. wrestlers. It's this is the art of wrestling is where we tell our locker room stories because it really did come out of me, you know, essentially like the wrestling road diaries one, you know, it's me and Daniel Bryan and Sal Renaro and we're in the locker room and we're, we're just cutting it up and we're having a good time. And I, and I thought it was so cool that, that I could give the fan the, I could show the fan that this is what the locker room is like. And then that almost brought on this bigger picture of this podcast is, well, I can show everybody what every, you know, what a locker room is like with every wrestler. And I think the stories just drive people to, to think of their own stories. And so um, now this is the platform for everybody's own stories. And yeah, like, you know, the first episode, it, it there's variations of this. You know, one of my favorites is this guy who brought, ha brought his kid to a show and Haku wanted to play with the kid. And Haku started telling this one-year-old that he was going to train him to be a wrestler when he was older <laughs> or stories of uh, another guy talked about. And I, you know, a lot of us have the same story of how, he used to call the WCW hotline because Mean Gene told him to. And then his dad sat him down with this phone bill at the time, which was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I think we can all relate to that. And uh, and I get to kind of pick which ones, you know, kind of uh, fancy me. You know, it's essentially I'm the one who gets to pick. So it's kind of the ones that I pop for almost. And uh, that's my job as as the host. I've always said that wrestling is kind of like that scene in Step Brothers. When you find out that somebody else is also a wrestling fan, it's like, did we just become best friends? Yep. Yeah. And unlike any other sport, I mean, I'm sure there's a few TV shows that have that, you know, that link. But if someone's like, oh, I'm a baseball fan, you're like, oh, cool, I'm a baseball fan as well. But with wrestling, I don't know, it's, it's something that's like ingratiated in who you are. It's like part of your personality. And because wrestling has been looked down upon you know, for, for it, it is the redhead stepchild. You know, when you just said that, I thought of Freaks and Geeks. It's like, if I know someone who liked Freaks and Geeks, the TV show, you know, that was on one season or whatever, yeah. I, I would be like, oh my God, did we just become best friends? Because I, you know, I, I feel someone who liked that show is on the same wavelength as me in terms of, you know, TV and comedy and humor and all of that. And I think wrestling is the same. For some reason, there's such a weird mixture and I'm preaching to the choir because if you're here, you're a wrestling fan. So, yeah. you know, there's some mixture of it that's so weird that, you know, why do we get sucked in? Who knows? Because I feel we all did from such a young age. So it has some, you know, we don't, we're, we don't know why, you know, it's some, yeah. something deeper mentally in us, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I always say for me, it was, I'm an eighties kid. So it was just a mix. It was a mixture of like, I love sports, but I loved He-Man and Teen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I love blood sport. And, you know, so like, it, that's just like the mix. I feel wrestling is just a mixture of all of that. If you, before you were a wrestler, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a sure. second. Before you were a wrestler and you were just a fan. I mean, you're still a fan now, but before you were performing, what would be the story that you would call in with to your show? Okay. And I, I, I'm going to ask you the same question right afterwards. So um, I want you to think while I'm saying <laughs> I better it. prepare. Okay. <laughs> um, I, so I, I have done a little bit of stand up before and um, I, I love doing it like in Chicago. I'll go to an open, you know, an open, not an open mic, but just like a local show. Marty DeRosa is my buddy, a longtime buddy. I hope a lot of people know Marty and he's, you know, almost like one of the kings of stand up in Chicago. And so I started developing this story. I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but essentially when I was 16 years old, um, I was in an AOL chat room and a guy hit me up and he was like, oh, do, you know, it says in your AOL profile that you like wrestling. And I was like, yes, I like wrestling. And um, in his profile, you know, it said he was 40 and, you know, it said he liked Greco-Roman wrestling and bodybuilding. And, you know, so 
uh, he was like, Hey, I'm out of practice. Would you like to come over and wrestle with me? I have some mats in the basement. Oh no. And then <laughs> I was like, um, that's super weird, dude. And again, I'm 16 years old. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I should meet you first. So I know you're uh, on the up and up. Uh, then we can go practice wrestling in your basement because I was 16 and, you know, he didn't know what I looked like, but I was, uh, uh, you know, I was, a, I was, I just loved professional wrestling. I was a yeah. football player and I just wanted to wrestle. That's all I want to do so bad. And so I was about to go and meet him at this local pizza place. And then my mom stopped me and, you know, I put comedy bits into it, uh, in stand up, but essentially my mom stopped me and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going to meet this guy for pizza to see if we can wrestle in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and she put a you know she put a halt to that and you know the punchline is 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 like well what he doesn't know is that you know I, you know if he was that way i would i would beat the crap out of him because, yeah. you know was, Your mom might have stopped you from getting abducted for sure for i mean for sure she did and that's yeah. why we think we know everything when we're that age and looking back on it yes. it's crazy but it's also it just shows how much i loved pro wrestling <laughs> that i didn't have you know, in my school, there wasn't a lot of wrestling fans, if any. And yeah. so I, I was just dying to connect with wrestling fans, dying to connect with wrestling fans. And this was someone I saw as someone who also liked wrestling. And um, yeah, little little did I know. Looking back. <laughs> Maybe his intentions were good. You never know. Right, right. We don't know. We don't yeah. know. But that's, that's, you know, that's, that's the kind of story that I can see being on the show. Uh, a wide variety. Anything, anything. It's any kind of story that has anything to do with wrestling. I think for me, like when I get into something, like I dive all the way in. I'm super passionate. It's just like my personality. I don't check the depth of the water. Don't check the temperature of the water. I just dive right in. And when I became like a big wrestling fan in the Attitude Era, I was 15. I was aware of wrestling before that. I was a high school wrestler. But a buddy of mine named Vince, he did this crazy thing in the 90s called talking on the phone, which is so wild, right? And I knew Monday nights at nine o'clock, our phone call would abruptly come to an end because he was a huge wrestling fan and Raw was on. And one Monday night, our conversation wasn't done. So I said, all right, I'll, I'll hang on the phone with you so we can keep talking. I'll put on the TV so I can watch this thing you're watching. And I got so sucked in. It was Rock, or it was Austin and McMahon was the big storyline at the time. And it went from me like never watching any wrestling to watching everything. Raw and Nitro and Thunder and ECW and you know, Jacked and Metal and everything, Heat. And then I became, very quickly became a backyard wrestler. Yes. And we would all walk home from school in this big group together and our one friend Becca had a trampoline in her backyard. So that trampoline quickly became the place where we learned how to do rock bottoms, choke slams, stunners, the really easy moves. Then through a friend, found out that he had some gym mats in his backyard and we started a backyard wrestling federation. And my parents hated wrestling, still do, still do very much. So much so that I would watch TV in the basement and my dad would stand in front of the TV and I'd be like, dad, I, I can't see what's going on here. The rock's doing something. My dad, like my dad would call it pornography. Like he's <laughs> so, so angry. But my mom was like, you're not, you're not back here wrestling. And I would pack my gym bag, say I was going to the gym. And I feel so bad that I lied to my mom and I would go to my friend's house and we would backyard wrestle. And then one day she's like, why do you have knee pads and um, tape in your gym bag? Were you wrestling? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I was wrestling. So, and I didn't stop. I just said, look, this is a thing I love. This is a thing I'm passionate about. We do this as safely as we can. And we're going to continue doing this. And then not long after that, I threw my buddy off a bridge. He broke his leg, became a viral hit in 2001 on like LimeWire or I was, I was Kaza or something like that. Yeah, what are the <laughs> college humor or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think that was it for me. Uh, and then after that, I, you know, I vowed that I was going to train to be a pro wrestler and did. And then, you know, long story short, was basically at this crossroad. Like, am I going to continue with wrestling school because I'd been there for a few months or continue with school school because I was in college and decided I'd continue on the broadcasting path. And now I'm really fortunate. I can still dip my toe into the wrestling world. Right. With, you know, great conversations like this. I was going to say, I was when you said, mom, we're doing it safely. That my first question was like, but were you? No. And then it, right, right you off were, the And bridge. it's so funny when I went to wrestling school, I realized we did everything wrong. We were giving everything on the right-hand side and wrestling is supposed to all be done on the left-hand side. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> I love it. It was as, uh, it was, 
I look back at it now and I think if my kid did that, I would be terrified. Terrified. Yeah, imagine what? if your kid said they were going to go meet a 40 year old in the, in the guy's basement. <laughs> I mean, Before luckily, you, luckily we get out, you know, we've, we, we get out of it and we're safe, you know, for, for did, both of us. Did you determine at a young age that you were going to be a pro wrestler? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember watching, um, cause you know, it shows my age. I was born in 80. So like when I was 14, like in 94, APW was the first one to really utilize the internet pretty well in like video clips. Now I say that I, uh, I I believe Ruckus was the first person who used the video the video very well. He used to do backyard clips that I f- would find probably on Kazar or whatever you were saying, right? Like um, he used to wrestle Claude Morrow in the backyards. I remember him doing like crazy flips. And later I learned out him and Sanjay. You know they were in those best of the backyard videos, but uh, a- APW was doing those garage wars, and they they had a guy. You know it wasn't Roland Alexander who was tech savvy, you know, he just took your money and asked you to, to read your labels. Right. Um, you know, it was one of their back end guys who just, who had figured out the internet a little better than most of the wrestling people. And so I remember they had like a, a summer camp that you could go to. And I remember being 14 or 15 being like, mom, I want to go to this summer camp and her obviously being like, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, and so that was, I mean, that was like something I remember from a young age. And, and I also got uh, the torch and I'm, and I've been cleaning out my room here and I, I, I have torches back to like, 93 94 so i was 13 or 14 reading about the insides of wrestling and that's really when i started reading uh, you know i credit that all the time is like when i saw the results of like uswa 75 people you know like i was like oh i could wrestle in front of 75 people you know <laughs> i knew i couldn't wrestle in front of you know 10,000 people with vader and Shawn michaels or whatever but you know i could be whatever I could be on those crappy little shows. Like there's shows for people like me. That's what I always thought. So even at that young age, I I think reading, uh, you know, uh, the quote unquote dirt sheets from a very young age helped guide me to realize it was a realization. And which is funny because I think it would scare a lot of people away, but for me, it really made it closer to home. Like, Oh, this is something I could actually do. I never saw myself as a large in the life person. I was just a, you know, a, a chubby Jewish kid from the suburbs. So like, you know, I didn't see myself as a big star, but I could, I just wanted to wrestle so I could see myself on smaller shows and reading about reading on the torch and reading the inside information really made it more real and realistic for me. What were some of the jobs that you had growing up while you were trying to make it in wrestling? (laughs) Oh, let's see. Um, Well, I mean, I was a umpire. I was a little league umpire for a lot of years. Uh, I had to, so I had to get I, I did go to, so when I did go to college and I got my degree in business, wow. I started training in 99. I went to school in 98, tried, I won. I, my mom said I couldn't go to wrestling school. So I played football. I think I told you that before yeah. I quit. I quit foot. I quit college football after a year, started training. So stayed in school. I had the school of Western Michigan made me get an internship. So I had to get an internship. I was, I almost got it at wow magazine. If you remember that one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that was right around the corner from where I lived. And I was wrestling at the time, but uh, I think Bill after blew me off at the point. He would, you know, <laughs> so I got one um, folding boxes in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which was an awful job. Um, but th- I think the main job that I had after graduating college and like being a ring of honor superstar at the time, but there wasn't, you know, there wasn't that much money there and, and hustling and, and, and going all over the places for two years, I was a teaching assistant and I worked with kids with, um, I was a one-on-one with a kid with down syndrome. And I worked, uh, also with kids with special needs as a middle school teaching assistant. Oh, wow. And you know, what happened was I think I made $11,000 a year doing that. And it got to the point where I think I made 7,500 or $8,000 a year wrestling. Wow. And I was like, I think I could do the wrestling full time, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, um, so after two years, I stopped teaching and I became a full-time wrestler on $7,500 or $8,000. And I and I always remember reading William Regal's book where Regal basically said, um, you know, he came from a good enough family, but he made himself poor. And that is something that always stuck with me and something that I had done is essentially I, I made myself poor. Like I didn't count on anybody else. I said to myself, I make this much money. I'm not going to overspend. Um, you know, I can only spend on rent and health insurance and the gym and some food. And that's what I did. And that's why 
a lot of my frugal ways are the way that it, ways they are. Luckily, I make a lot more than that these days, but it's still burned in my head is like, we're not going to make much money in wrestling. And I still like, can't believe every year I still make great, great money. It, bl- it blows my mind. I always assume it'll just go away the next year. You, um, you must be like investing still so much of it. Like you, you probably still live that frugal mentality. I do. Yeah, I do. And I, and I, you know, and I had some crazy monetary stuff that happened to me a couple of years ago. And since then, even then I, I doubled down harder on investing and learning about investing. And I've really, you know, I, I got a lot of money taken away from me. So I really learned how to invest my money smartly, which is, it's weird that I wasn't doing that before then, but also a lot of me was like, I, I can't have this plan because I never, I never know when it's going to get chopped off. So I never wanted to be it. I never wanted my money put into something that I couldn't take it out of that always scared me. But um, since then I've gotten kind of a little smarter and wiser with my investing, which is good. Um, but I, lo- I did love the job teaching assistant, but the problem was, is I was working Monday through Friday and it got to the point where I had asked the principal, I was like, can I take Friday off? I have to fly to London to do it two shows. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think every teaching assistant was flying to London. You know, Matt Stryker and I had a very similar thing going on. You know, he, luckily my principal was all about it. Um, he hit it and then got in a lot of trouble, obviously from the New York media, for those who don't know that story is he did a tour of Japan, didn't tell anybody the New York school system found out and he got in a lot of trouble for taking sick days to go tour with zero one. Uh, luckily for me, you know, I, my team was a little better or not a little better. I mean, I obviously, uh, my team was more, was all about my dream, which was great. And then following the second year, I, it was just so hard to balance both. I was ready to dive in and do it full time. Well, and you didn't have to lie to them if they were in on the stream with you. <laughs> yeah, they they knew, you know, Mr. Cabana was a, a pro wrestler. I remember one time I came to class, I'd wrestle AJ Styles. Uh, this was 2000, must have been 2003, 2003 Jesus. Um, uh, IWA Mid-South, Clarksville, Indiana, in front of maybe 75 people. And he, you know, he does that second rope moonsault into the reverse DDT. Oh, love it. Yeah, well, this point, I do it in WWE, by the way. Well, those ropes are probably hard to do it with. Well, he did it to me, Chris, but I was a little too close and he didn't float up as much and shot straight backwards. And the back of his head just went right into my eye and it swolled up my eye. Yeah. And so the next week and a half, I was the teacher roaming the halls with just this giant black eye. And a lot of the teachers knew what I did, but I, you know, I didn't really tell the students so much. So I think they just all thought Mr. Cabana was, uh, was fighting in the streets, you know, a they wild called man, you Mr. Cabana. Well, they didn't call me that, but okay. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Colton, I won't, I'll break kayfabe for you. Whatever you want. Well, we can blur the lines here. I call my mom, Marsha Cabana. So <laughs> at what point did you realize in your career that things like were starting to fire on all cylinders and that this was actually a path you could go down and make a living at. Um, I think it was when ring of honor was constantly booking me for over three figures, a booking. I don't like to brag. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I figured out, yeah, like, uh, if I can get six bookings at a hundred bucks and make 50 bucks in the merch stand, I can do that. Yeah. And then I would, you know, I would make more than that. And then I would put that money away and I would still try to make that baseline figure. But I, I think it was ring of honor that really gave me the confidence because it was a, it was a constant, but it was like two or three or four bookings a month. And I knew I would always have that for, for decent money at the time. And then I knew ring of honor would boast, boost my profile and I can make a little better money other places. And that's kind of how it's always worked for me is that you boost your profile and then you try to, you know, you try to tour a little bit with that profile. And that's something I've done my whole career. And so, you know, luckily for me, it didn't get so giant quickly that taking a step back, like a good example would be some of these wrestlers who get, who are making six figures with WWE, but necessarily haven't lived that independent life. That's fine. But when you, when they get back to the independence and they're asking for 5,000 a shot, because that's what they got for their check. Yeah. Like here's a wake up call. It's going to be $75. And let's be honest. I don't even know if you're going to make that back in ticket sales, friend, you know? So, um, it's, it's, so it's hard. It's good for me that I never had to take too many step backs and I've always gradually just climbed. Um, 
in terms of notoriety, in terms of uh, physicality, in terms of uh, financially. Um, and that's been a, a great career trajectory for myself. I mean, you made a name for yourself and you were definitely like, people were finding out who you were through Ring of Honor. WWE finds out who you are, sign you to a deal, which I would think is the big step that you take in your career. I was really surprised to learn that you actually took a pay cut to go to WWE. Yeah, like a 50% pay cut. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> yeah, um, that's just what it was. You know, I remember my friend saying like, my friend who was in the same boat as me uh, maybe a year and a half before, and he was just like, this is the sacrifice you have to make because the potential is there and the potential isn't there on the indies. And what's funny is, you know, years later when I came back and I started my own thing and it got to the point in 2012, 2013 or whatever, where I was making more money than lower card or even some of the mid card WWE guys, which was not a thing, which, you know, I don't even think it was a, ever a thing. It's crazy yeah. that I could sit here and say that. Not a lot of people even really know that, but at that point in 2007, 2006, you know, you could, there was a ceiling to independent wrestling and independent wrestling money for, for most people. And so, yeah, I, I took an investment in myself and I, you know, I said like, if I'm going to become a millionaire or whatever it is, I think, I guess WWE is the only way that I can do it. And so I'll dive in, I'll move to Louisville and let's give it a shot. Louisville, you were there with OVW. At what point during your tenure there, did you realize this is not working? Oh, the first day. No, oh. just kidding. <laughs> just, um, it wasn't not working. It's, it, it was, I, I always knew that, like I said, I was, I'm never a bigger, larger than life guy. I, di I didn't look like Ricky Ortiz who was there. You know, I didn't look like Dolph. I didn't have Dolph Ziggler's body. I didn't look like Jake Hager. You know, these were all people that were there with me in OVW. I didn't look like Drew McIntyre. So I always knew I had to sneak in as like, um, like a, like a bit player. Like I always saw the Santino role and I'm not saying as Santino, but if you, you know, the story of Santino was like, they were going to Italy. They needed someone Italian. Oh, Santino, can you speak Italian? And he's like, yeah, sure. Boom. He's on the show. Right. He's Canadian. <laughs> right. Well, you know, you do what you got to do. Um, uh, so I was like, man, you know, like, I'll be in the system. I'll be really good. I know I can get over in Louisville. I had wrestled there for years with IWA. So that, so when I started in OVW, the crowd down there knew who I was. So I was over right away. You know, I, I me and Spears were the two time tag champions. I was a television champion. Uh, in that little system, I was over and I was good to go, but that doesn't mean anything in the big time system. So, you know, I, what was I hoping for? They, they were going to tour Israel. You know, maybe they got an Israel TV deal. They needed a Jewish wrestler. Uh, you know, maybe they needed a funny sidekick. I had, I had pitched ideas to be the general manager of Sunday Night Heat, which at that point was taken off TV and just on WWE.com. I thought that was a funny idea. You know, I was trying to, I was trying to weasel my way in somehow. I, I didn't expect to be called up to wrestle John Cena. And, and there's a story I tell where I think it was uh, Dave Lagana goes like, pitch me an idea. And I was like, uh, I want to be the Sunday Night Heat general manager. And he's like, if, he goes, that's what you're pitching. Like, you got to think bigger than that. And I was like, Okay, so the next week I wrote, here's my pitch. I debut at WrestleMania. I beat John Cena. Undertaker comes down. I pile driver him. I, you know, I take both belts. I'm the champion. You you send me to, you know, Letterman, whatever it is. And then he was like, okay, I, I see what you're saying. I was like, yeah, I got to sneak <laughs> in the back door here, buddy. That's how this right. works. When did you make the conscious shift that you were going to go from, and I'll use air quotes here, regular guy wrestler to comedy guy wrestler? So this is something... Um, that I think a lot about, and I, I, well, I, so they say being your, your natural self, right. Is the right move yeah. in professional wrestling. And I'm going to use Nigel McGinnis as an example of like, I, at, at, at a point I was regular guy wrestler and I was doing really good on the independence and making a name for myself. And I, and I am a good wrestler. And I really thought about the longevity of my career. And it's like, I could go and another side note is like, I was on shows with Loki, Christopher Daniels, AJ Styles, and those guys were the best. And I, I, athletically, I was not better than them. So I didn't, un, I didn't see a point in like trying to have their matches because they would be the best. But I look at Nigel and Nigel said to a point where he wanted to be a main event player. And he said, I looked at this, I looked at 
the system of how it was built, the independent system, and you had to beat the crap out of yourself. And you look at, you know, the matches he had with Daniel Bryan and he did become a main event player, but he had a two year career on, on top of the independence and, you know, like a cup of coffee in TNA. And so I really said to myself, like, you know, I could drop myself on my head every single match and I could, you know, really destroy my body and have a good two, three year career on top, or I could, wrestle very safely develop this completely different style and enjoy pro wrestling. It's really, I love pro wrestling. I just love the idea of going from town to town, you know, especially after my WWE run from like 2010 to 2000, even to, you know, to the pandemic, it was just like, I would just hit up all the shows and, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily spot lit by a company. I was just a traveling comedian salesman. <laughs> and that's, that idea has given me such longevity in wrestling. It will give me more years. And I, I hate to harp on Nigel. I love Nar Nigel. I think he was one of the greatest wrestlers of my generation, but you know, sadly his wrestling career got cut very short and mine has many years to go. And I do attribute that to the comedic wrestling style and just trying to be as safe as I can with my, with my body while giving the most entertaining performance I can give. And I think that's the important thing is, when I go to these small towns, when I go to these places, when I go to Japan, you know, I, the, the people enjoy the wrestling. You know, some of my favorite experiences is tagging with Yano in New Japan, where, you know, our reactions, you know, I'm sorry that we do not wrestle like Ibushi or, uh, you know, Okada. And I'm not saying our reactions were as big as Ibushi or Okada, but I'm saying we got reactions, you know, the same way the other wrestlers for the crazy yeah, yeah. moves we got reactions and it was through making the, the, the crowd laugh. And there's something to me about seeing like a nine-year-old Japanese girl just <laughs> laughing so hard. I think Yano and I both like, I think we, we, we don't speak the same language, but I think we both have the same feelings when we see a little kid enjoying our match. At the height of your time on the Indies, as a percentage, what were you making from your rate to wrestle? And what were you making from merch and autographs and everything there? I think it was, I always say it was, it was like a, a third split for the most part. So like, it was like r rates, one third mm -hmm. podcasting stuff, another third merchandise was another third. Wow. But the and fact that, that merch is making as much as your appearance fee, that's, that's impressive. And I was, you know, I was before pro wrestling, before Ryan and I came up with pro wrestling tees, you know, I was selling coltmerch.com, you know, so and there, there were not a lot. There's a handful of wrestlers that were doing it. I'm not going to say not a lot, but there's a handful of wrestlers. So I was taking advantage of online orders, telling people that it was coming from me. And it's still, I ship out of this room right here. You know, I still do the same thing. So, um, and then there was, and still is, you know, extra, there's acting bits. I was making a lot of, I was making really good money doing mocap, you know, in the video, I did a lot of video game work that nobody really knows. What video about. game would we see you in? Uh, I mean, I think WWE 2K 11 through 19. Oh, you and Eli Drake. Me, Eli Drake, Sanjay, Jay Lethal, Trent. I mean, there's just Micah Taylor, Mikey Mondo. There's so many of us that were like unsung heroes of those video games, which in hindsight, like, we didn't get paid that much, but compared to our wrestling rate, we were, you know, for five, eight days in a row yeah. and being put up in a nice hotel and being fed. Yeah. And, you know, like it was the greatest gig in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but the, but the fact that you were, you were very much at the forefront. Uh, we talked about this a lot in our last interview, but you were very much at the forefront for changing the way that pro wrestlers made money, changing the way that independent pro wrestlers made money. You doubled down on the merch table and now it's weird if you go to a wrestling show and you don't have a merch table. I know I'm sometimes I'm I look at myself and I'm like, oh, I think I had a lot to do with this. And I'll look at like the other wrestlers who are brand new who have had had two matches and are like have a bigger merch table than me. And I know they don't even know who I am. <laughs> and I'm like, oh God, you know, like what am I? What is this? Like I was like, you you're not even gonna give me some space at the table because you got here first and like. I'm not saying I'm playing the vet card, but sometimes I'm like, come on, can I get some space here at this table? I always feel bad for some of those guys because they've got a suitcase full of three smalls, four mediums, seven larges, and so on and so on and so on. You know, and sometimes you only sell a shirt or two and it's just town to town to town with a suitcase full of merch. Yeah, I like, it's a wake up call. I like that actually. You could feel bad for them. I like, 
that's a re- <laughs> that's a reality check, Chris. You know, like I like that when I'm when I'm moving big merch and then I look over and this person with 85 shirts and they only sell one. I'm like, yeah, you should. You know, get I, I'm like, get a little more over in the ring. And that's how this stuff moves. I just uh, feel bad because they've put all this money in the inventory that may not sell. Yes, but that's so that's what a lot of people don't understand about pro wrestling. The wrestler specifically is the merch moves when you get over. Mm. So you unless you have the greatest design or you're sponsored by Nike or whatever, like <laughs> the merch moves because you're over as a performer and the people want to support you because they like what you're doing and they love what they're doing and they want you to do more of it. So they want you to be a wrestler. So you don't have to get another job. That's the beauty of the merch. So the better you get at wrestling, the more you learn the moves, the more you learn how it works, you know, that it's so people want to know the keys to selling merch. It's being a great wrestler. It really is. Some people are great wrestlers, but they're not good with the merch. You, if you can get, you have to be the great wrestler and then also be good with the merch. So that's the number one key to moving stuff is being, is being good. <laughs> Outside of wrestling, what's the biggest entrepreneurial skill that you learned through all of this? Um, I don't know if it's, entre- I, to me, I don't know if it's this thing that will give me the most success, but I like creating, I, I like puzzle. I, I like analytical and puzzle making in my own head for different things. So it gives me a lot of satisfaction. I, this will come back to wrestling a little bit, but it gives me a lot of sex, satisfaction to have a match, to put it together, to know the scenario, you know, to know where we need to go in two weeks, to know the outcome, and then start putting the puzzle of a wrestling match together. Or when it comes to editing or podcasting is um, clipping it together. Like if I did an Instagram, a live Instagram, w- where I take phone calls, with fans. And then I know I want to clip that into a three minute YouTube clip. I love finding the best pieces and, and finding the best comedic aspects and where the laughs are going to be. That's why I I really enjoyed. That's why I enjoy doing the comedy outside of the wrestling. When I go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, or when I go on to, you know, a, a wrestling or a comedian's podcast, or if I do improv shows with my friends in Chicago is I like, I like doing the math of how the jokes and the joke structure and what will work best and why it will work. And just, you know, like with wrestling, I do that math in my head, but I do it really fast because I've been doing wrestling for 22, 23 years now. So it it works really fast. And so with comedy, like I've been doing comedy a long time through wrestling, but on the stage, it's a little bit different. So I enjoy that process of trying to get fast and better in an outside wrestling aspect with comedy through, it's weird to say through analytics because comedy should be like a creative venture, but I, I, I feel my creativity um, and and comedy pours out well while doing weird puzzles and analytics of the art itself. I know that sounds strange, but no, but you're basically saying you love the process. Yeah. There you go. (laughs) Journey is in fact the destination, right? I I think a lot of people, were surprised that it took you so long to sign with AEW. You know, you were such good friends with a lot of the EVPs. And I think that a lot of people assume that you'd be one of the original people that were announced. Why was there a lag till you joined? Um, yeah, it just, I, I think, you know, I was with ring of honor and there was just some things, there was some things politically going happening, um, just in general, and it just wasn't the right time. And it got to the point where, um, I, yeah, I just kind of said to myself, well, I got to the point with Ring of Honor where I was just like, um, I, I think my time here is done. They they were really focusing me on a commentator and I still felt I had good years wrestling left. And I felt I was just going there not to collect a check because I loved working with Ian and Ian Riccoboni is so good. I don't know if he gets the credit that he deserves. So good. We had him so on the show good. a few months ago. Yeah, he he's amazing. And, and I got a great respect for commentators like Ian, like Kevin Kelly, like Excalibur, who, um, and um, Tom Phillips is another one who I did a tryout with in 2013, who can retain the information, you know what I'm saying? It's so wild that they can retain this city that, you know, right off their, right off their head. It's such a skill to have. Um, And so, but, you know, I, I felt that I was just going there to go there. I liked commentating, but I wanted to wrestle. And so I had made that decision. I told the 
the, the powers that be. And then at that same time, I had gotten a really good spot with new Japan at the point. So this is when me and Yano started kicking out. So I said, I think I'm going to focus more on new Japan and the independence. And then I, you know, I told um, the bucks that like, Hey, you know, here's my situation. You know, I, I I'm out there. If it's something you want, I'm there. If it's not no big deal, you know, I'm just letting you know that, I'm kind of free and I'm roaming around. And so, um, yeah, the bucks went right to uh, Tony and, and they all had a meeting and, you know, they were like, yeah, of course you're a lot of the reason why a lot of this is happening and we want you on board and however we can use you, we want you to use you. And, you know, I, I I don't think I I knew right away, like, it's not like I was there to be the John Moxley of the promotion, but you know, Matt, Matt Jackson said something like we, we just want your brain around. Um, and so, you know, they've used me in an aspect of like um, a wrestler. I'm also a coach or slash, you know, a producer there. I help with a lot of like the dark match, uh, AEW dark. And um, I'm there. We have great coaches. We have these coaches who have been around, you know, for years in different systems. But it's I think it's important that, you know, this was all built around essentially, you know, the Bucks and Kenny and Cody and, and Hangman, you know, that era of independent wrestling, something I've been around for so long. And so to have a mind from that era to, to help with the wrestlers, you know, I think it's just as I, I obviously I'm, I'm not near a Dean Malenko or, you know, an Arn Anderson or, you know, Billy Gunn or whatever it is. I don't have their experiences, but I do have the experiences that they don't have of the grind on the independent scene um, and that kind of new modern style of wrestling. And so that's, you know, a lot of that doing that and being around and helping young wrestlers and help and being a part, you know, uh, a pivot, um, a pivotal player. What I don't know, a, a player within, within the, um, the dark order, you know, I was going to say like a game, a game player, a sixth man off the bench, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> just being around. It's um, it's been great. And, you know, I, you know, Matt, you know, said we, we just want you around. It's important. And uh, I feel it's important to be around. And when I'm around, it feels important, you know, that I'm with my friends, we're making art. I help within this art. I can help young wrestlers and also I can help old wrestlers who um, might not understand this new, you know, era of wrestling. And I think it's important that we AEW keeps to the new era. Kenny Omega is our champion um, at, well, at the time that this is going out uh, is, is important to represent this era of professional wrestling. And, you know, I, I just think that's important. And I think we're doing a great job. And I love, uh, I love, I, I love that. I signed also, I signed a, f- I hadn't signed a contract since the the WWE one where I signed for 50% less than I was making in what in my whole career. And then I signed a, I signed a contract and, and a, a month later, the world shuts down and independent wrestling stops. Yeah. So, I mean, what a sign that was, if it was a sign, you know, I, I don't believe in a higher power, but if I did, he was help. He, she, them, they were helping me out. Yeah, it was perfect timing for you because all the money you would have been making from independent shows would have disappeared and it has disappeared. Yes, yes, gone. Yeah, gone. So, I mean, great, I'm so grateful for Tony Khan. And not only am I grateful for Tony Khan, there's, you know, hundreds of people that are grateful for Tony Khan and TNT for being flexible and saying, hey, you know, you could tape every other week, you know, and Tony had this safe outdoor place that he yeah. obviously daily place with Jacksonville. So that it just all, everything aligned so well together. And he saved a lot of people's lives. If anybody else owned AEW, started AEW, it wouldn't have been possible. It wouldn't have so. just so, just so happened that they had TIA Bankfield next to it is this outdoor amphitheater called Daly's place. It just so happened that you can snap your fingers and you'd already done a show there. Let's do a whole bunch of shows there now. Yeah. And there was, you know, there's so much, the locker rooms, there was so much, there's just so much space. It's so, and so when, you know, when everyone's saying social distance and be outside, it's like, we were outside and we were yeah. social distance. It was great. Yeah. And well, and also there were some shows, uh, at, uh, the nightmare factory, which I think you guys kind of, I don't think you, I guess you were there at that time. Right? Uh, yeah. I was part of, yeah. T- and Tony talks about those days of like, it was such a trimmed down roster and that was so scary. You know, I, I was going to drive to those shows in the last second. I was just like, you know, driving and getting out for gas is just going to be as brutal as getting on an airplane with 
two people. There was two people on the airplane. And so, you know, I had three masks on and I had like a, a hoodie over my head and I was just trying to get away from everybody, but there was nobody on that airplane. It was such a wild time to look back at. Um, and especially in 10 years to look back at Oh my gosh! O'Hare airport, which I had gone to for 20 years, every single week jam packed. And it was crickets wild. Wow. So wild. Yeah. This is going to be an era that we look back on, like you said, in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. And we go, that was the, the COVID era. Things mm -hmm. were a little bit different then. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm romantic about that kind of stuff. Um, and I, you know, it's fun. I guess it's not, it's okay for me to say that because I'm healthy and I, you know, but so many people lost their lives and lost yeah. loved ones and, and jobs and the economy and everything. So it's, it's very sad. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'll just, I wear, I wear my mask. I got my shots. I'm vaccinated and I'm, you know, doing, I'm doing and did my part. When you talk about your style of wrestling, being able to give you some longevity, do you think about what's next for you in this industry? Can you wrestle into your fifties? Yeah. Into my sixties, I think. <laughs> into your sixties. I mean, look at, listen, when I'm no Billy Gunn, um, he is a freak of nature, but oh, he what is. is he 58 now? Like, and he looks better than not only half our roster, but I would say 80% of our roster, including his children. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you look, it gives me a lot of hope to look at wrestlers like Billy to, to look at PCO, uh, Christopher even, Daniels, even Christopher Daniels. Yeah. And just say to myself, like, oh, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I was like, I guess it, in my late 30s, I'll have to hang it up. And, you know, I don't see it happening anytime soon. And, you know, if I'm not able to stick with AEW for the rest of my career, which I hope I do, um, you know, I'm I'm happy to be uh, to do, to play my softball league of the independent, you know, like my old timer <laughs> softball league, you know, a couple of times a month, go out there and wrestle on the Indies and have fun. And, and so that's kind of how I view it. But, you know, I think people get the idea that I've been setting myself up for post wrestling my whole career Yeah, through, you know, just learning the merch, learning the multimedia, all of this stuff. It's something I just don't, worry about as someone who's always had a lot of worry about their future um i i just don't worry about my future in in that way because um yeah i think i'll be fine i think whatever i do you'll be yeah. totally fine i mean yeah. you've got other great business ventures that don't involve wrestling as well or don't involve you being in a ring wrestling Right. And that's the most important thing. And, and I've said that a, a lot again, you know, and I'll reiterate is when I got fired from WWE, I said, I never wanted to put my eggs in one basket. I have to just make a bunch of different baskets. So if one gets taken away, I still have a lot of options. And that's what I've done since 2009. I've made sure I have a lot of options if something gets taken away. And well, you know what? Like, sorry, but COVID is one of the COVID took everything away from a lot of people. And luckily I had different things that I was still able to do and still able, you know, still able to make some money. What would your best advice be for the 17 year old kid who's listening to this right now and wants to be a pro wrestler one day? I, this is the advice I give to everybody at, at my school, at, when I do seminars, whatever it is, but I say have small goals. I'm not sure if I said this on your podcast or not no. before. Yeah. Small goals are so important. If you go to wrestling school saying I'm going to be in WrestleMania, um, that's my goal. And you don't make it to WrestleMania, you're going to consider yourself or your career a failure. But if you say to yourself, I want to learn how to do a drop kick. I want to learn how to do a body slam. I want to have one match outside of the state that I live in. I want to get flown to a wrestling show. I want, you know, Chris to, to interview me one day. Like these are, you know, you have these little goals. That's not a little goal. I apologize, Chris, but no, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> real small <laughs> I'm build you know I'm building up and so um if you have those goals and they're obtainable you, you know you get a a sense of satisfaction from each individual goal that you hit there's a a, a, a spurt of dopamines there you feel like you've done something and so sure maybe you know your ultimate goal is to be an aew wrestler but make sure you have those small goals so you get satisfaction out of learning how to do a hip toss so almost like stair steps. So like you've accomplished this one goal now onto the next little goal. So all these little micro goals. And I've always said like, it's so important to celebrate these little wins along the way. Sure. If your goal is to get signed to AEW or to wrestle at WrestleMania, great. 
but that might be 76 goals away from where you currently are. Right. Or 10 years or 50, 15 sure. years for a lot of us. Look at the Sami Zayn's and the Kevin Owens and the Eddie Kingston's of, of wrestling. And it's so great. But you know, if you thought they were holding out just to make it to where they've made it, it, it wouldn't be possible. They've had these little goals. Yeah. Who has been the biggest inspiration for you both in wrestling and outside of wrestling? Oh, that's a hard one for me. I, I, I get it. Listen, I get I've been doing the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is uh, the largest co comedy and arts festival in the world for the past, I think, seven years. And obviously not last year or this year because of COVID and everything. But um, that's where I get a lot of my inspiration is from live performance and comedy and comedians and alt alt performers, you know, punk rock scene. Um, the Although I'm not that much into music, like I love the idea, the DIY performer. Mm. I get so much influence and inspiration from the DIY performer. And so I can't necessarily like, I, I don't want to put my, my, you know, I don't want to say this one specific person because it really is a whole scene of, you know, um, you know, very early it was like Eddie Pepitone doing, who's a comedian doing these um, YouTube shows that, uh, that I started doing a YouTube series kind of based off that inspiration or even Chris Gethard, who was signed by Comedy Central uh, and then got fired and then started his own public access show and, you know, made, got that all the way to comedy, you know, back to, uh, not kind of to he got a show off based off that on True TV or Mark Marin, you know, starting in the, in the garage, nobody listened to his podcast and it blowing up. And um, there's just so many different people over so many different walks of life, but a lot of it isn't necessarily wrestling. And I, and I've said that because like, I don't, I, I don't want to copy people in wrestling too much because they're already doing that thing. And so a lot of times I'll see wrestlers do like moves that other people do that are in the scene at the moment, you know, when, when the young bucks were super kick happy and then everybody in the independent scene was all of a sudden they were doing super kicks, you know, I didn't say it out loud, but I would just say to myself, like, you're they're, they've done the super kicks. Why you have, you be somebody else, be something different. Yeah. And so it, it was always hard for me to take inspiration from wrestlers in the current scene. Now, of course, obviously like uh, I took a lot of inspiration from old British wrestlers, Les Kellett, Cat Weasel, uh, Vic Faulkner, Masambula. These are wrestlers in the sixties who I don't think a lot of people even know who they were. And I think there's a lot of great wrestlers who do that, who go back and kind of grab some of those tidbits. But I, you know, I, I I grab inspiration from 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 modern day com comedians and DIY artists, and I do. If I could give um, back to that seventeen year old question, that Please. yeah, is um, you know you know I don't know. Don't make your persona somebody else's exact persona who's doing it right now. Otherwise, you'll just be a second rate somebody else. That's just great life advice, really. You know, there you go. It really is. I, I wrap up every interview talking about gratitude because I think it's such an important thing that if you can be grateful, you'll live a great life. It's right here. Be great, be grateful. What are three things in your life, that's Cole? A, that's a YouTube plaque. Well, this one is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are three things in your life, Cole, that you're grateful for right now? Three things? Three things. Uh, well, my family who's very supportive of me. Um, the the positive wrestling fan base, I will say that. Mm. Although, you know, that negative wrestling fan base in their head, they are positive to the stuff that they love, yeah. <laughs> but they're very negative to the stuff that they hate. But great, yeah, uh, great wrestling fans. And, um, oh, I don't know. What am I grateful for? Um, a, a loving, I want to say like a loving person as uh, there's just so much whether it's pol you know whether it's politics or, or an open-minded person and i'm grateful for open-minded people who want to become informed who want to learn who um who, who are understanding of other people and uh, i think that's mm. so important I, you know i'd say important it's so important now but it's always been important yeah and um and i'm grateful for those people and i'm even more grateful for those people who can get to the who can get through or, or get that message through to people who are um, a little stuck in their ways and maybe stuck in the wrong ways or, you know, just 
I'm not saying my way is right or any way, anybody's way is right, but I, I, I will say, you know, hopefully be open-minded and willing to learn and, and just, um, I don't know, don't be so short-sighted. So those people, I'm grateful for them. That's now that's powerful because there's a lot of people that are stuck in their ways that go, I believe this thing. And I'm not talking, talking politics here. I'm just talking life in general. I think this is the best flavor of ice cream. I think this is the best wrestling company on the planet. I think this is the best pizza topping and I'm not going to see it any other way. Why can't we just go, Oh, that's cool. You like cookies and cream. Oh, I like mint chocolate chip. Great. Yeah. Let's eat ice cream together. It's all, sub it's all subjective. Yeah. And, and, and not even get to political, but like, there's a lot of people, if we did get political, there's a lot of people who see, this has helped me a lot is that sometimes I'll get fired up at a different, at, at, at someone, how someone feels. And I'll be like, how could they feel that way? I hate that person. Right. Like at first, but then I, I look at my AEW locker room and I know there's people who feel different ways that I feel, sure. but I'm like, but they're my friend and I've gone through war with them and I like them a lot. Like they are a great person. And that helps me keep me in check that um we don't have to we don't have to attack the other side and and uh you know the, the, we can all have the rights to our own opinions i will say that yeah you're one of the nicest guys in all of wrestling well some people won't say that <laughs> no i i always have such a great time talking with you whether it's on camera or off camera so thank you so much again you know people can check out your new podcast wrestling anonymous wherever they're listening to this podcast right now welcome back to the podcasting game Thank to our you. pod father of pro wrestling podcasts. I just, I loved podcasting when I first heard it. And I think it was just a little earlier than a lot of wrestling fans <laughs> knew what that podcasting was a thing. So I, I, I love jumping into the medium and learning about microphones and sound. And I'm still learning before this even started, Chris was telling me some stuff, some tech stuff that I'm going to use moving forward. So I love being in, in the podcasting realm. I, I'm, you know, I thought I was out for a little bit and it kind of made me sad. And so when this idea came up, uh, it made me happy and it's gotten me really inspired, uh, you know, for the, you know, my, you know, a is right now, AEW is a, you know, but B, C, D and E and all that, all those other things. I'm excited to jump into that. Also when it comes to technology, I I've been doing a lot of Twitch too. And I don't know if you've touched on Twitch, Chris, at all, or no. It, I, I've been a guest a few times, but I've never. I don't have. It's a fun. Game. I love it. Uh, I pl I play games, and I it's my sense of humor, and it's essentially live streaming, but with something to do. So that's the games part of it. Yeah. And um, it's a lot of fun. So uh, I'm at Twitch TV uh, slash Twitch TV slash Cole Cabana. Throw out all your socials. Yeah. Oh that? yeah. Twitter and Instagram at Cole Cabana. I started TikToking and then I stopped TikToking, but I still watch TikTok. TikTok. I'm the same. I yeah. was like, I had some videos that like blew up on TikTok, and then other videos that get like 300 and I'm like, huh. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I watch it all the time though. I think it's such a fun medium. So and addictive. I, yeah. Yeah. So addictive. <laughs> addictive. And it will be, I don't know the future, but like, you know, people should be the way, the way people were jumping on podcasts, people should be jumping on. If you're if you're a content maker, you should be jumping on TikTok if you could do it the right way and make good videos. If you can figure out, because it's a very specific style or type of video on TikTok that works. And I mm. get it. Like people want to feel something. They want to laugh or they want to like feel something in their heart. And if you can create that kind of content that is shareable, you're going to be a star. It's just a matter of actually figuring out what content that is. Yeah, I it's actually I'm friends with these two twins out of Vancouver. They were putting up the ring when I was doing an ECCW show years ago, and I just thought they were the funniest dudes ever. And their names are the Voros twins. And I told them to get on TikTok. And then they, do you know that Davinci one? Of course. Yeah. yeah. And, and so then they they blew up on TikTok. I'm not taking credit for it, but I was just like, you guys were made for TikTok. And um and so right, they're you know they're not high profile wrestlers yet. But they, they're high profile on the social media and they're doing really well. So it's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Cole, this is such a pleasure. Thank you again. Uh, thank you. Um, you're doing great. I'm proud of you. I told you that last time. Keep, keep doing it. You know, I'm working towards that YouTube plaque. Um, I'm putting up Wrestling Anonymous stuff on my YouTube strictly to get that friggin' plaque. I'm very jealous of you right now. Well, I am only doing this because I'm able to stand on the shoulders of those who came before me and the shoulders who 
I'm standing on are yours. So look at these traps, baby. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for even creating this lane that the rest of us can now be in. That's very kind of you. We'll end it there. Goodbye. <laughs>